So hi, this is Paul, and I've had a couple of conversations with Ron Dart, and Ron had some put some very interesting touchstones out there. But before we get that, Ron, how's that how's that book on Jordan Peterson coming? Coming along quite well. Most of the essays are moving along quite nicely. We're polishing off some of them. We're looking at Peterson's contributions and thought, writing, uh, and public um, lectures from a variety of angles. I think I'd mentioned previously, we want to avoid the two extremes of hagiography, some elements of the alt-right do that, or demonization, the trendy progressive left that just sees them as on the alt-right because he dares to question them without saying well, liberalism is about questioning that that historically has been classical liberalism and it's not very liberal of a liberal not to critique liberalism but many <laughs> progressives don't <laughs> so i'm in that in that sense peterson stands within an aspect of classical uh liberalism and so the, the book is just going to look at um his contributions. A few weeks ago, I was asked to lecture at um, on Peterson at University of British Columbia, which is our biggest university in BC, one of our biggest in Canada. It was quite interesting. I had to have security guards there to keep the hecklers away. And you would think, of, yeah, it's it's the irony, a uh, university, a place of critical thinking, and then there are some people you can't even talk about uh, in a university context. And so then you have to have security guards to say, listen, uh, heckling is out if you're going to keep it up you have to leave the room and so this is this is one of the uh, and all we were doing is at one point we were looking at that uh, peterson from a sociological perspective was why is he playing such a prominent role on the public stage these days what gap is he filling in that others have been shy about speaking on uh, what's the contribution he may be making to public discourse and what maybe some of his blind spots or his Achilles heels, and I mean, these are just simple elementary questions anyone at a university should ask, but it gets to the point where you're sort of forbidden to ask certain questions or to speak about certain people, and that, that doesn't bode or auger well for the future. No, it doesn't. No. My goodness, and, and I mean, and it's you. I mean, I've done a few videos with you. You don't strike me as someone out there who's either promoting or doing something to the patriarchy or something like that. You just want to have a talk. <laughs> well, it says a lot about the low level of intellectual thinking and critical thinking and civility at um, places um, like uh, elements of university, obviously all, you know, the broader university life. That's hopefully not what it's like, but there's always that contingency that is so uh, brittle and ideologically driven that they want to censor out discussion and they could be quite vocal and they try and drown people out and um, that's worrisome at a, at a university I, I mean you can see it sometimes in the popular realm but not at a not at a university and i don't know what's going on in some classes that you know the, the teachers are not um, in elastic way teaching people to critique their own premises and their own presuppositions and prejudices and and those they differ with, seeing they have immense contributions to make. I mean, Gandhi once said, you know, I keep my enemy closest to me. Uh, and, and so in that sense, you get to recognize your own prejudice and perhaps the good that the other is seeing that we may not see being finite and fallible in that sense. Yeah, yeah, wow. So yesterday I had a talk with uh, Alistair Roberts, who's a scholar in the UK. And we talked about we talked about Peterson a bit. One of the things that caught my attention about Roberts when he wrote back in March of last year a, a blog post on Peterson, understanding Jordan Peterson, he led off with a C.S. Lewis quote. And when I first started listening to Peterson and saw, you know, listened to what he was doing with mythology and his interest in some of that, I I immediately thought about C.S. Lewis and the true myth and some of the um, aspects of Lewis in and, you know, that I heard some resonance in terms of here's a, you know, watching what Tolkien and Lewis did and Lewis's transition to Christianity and thought Lewis would was for I decided then that Lewis would be a good person to bring into the conversation about Jordan Peterson. And so, you know, I've been playing with that over a, a number of my videos. And and we before before I started recording, you, you, you said some very interesting things about Lewis. And uh, I thought that might 
that's probably a pretty good place to start. So you you also mentioned in your email that you know Lewis Lewis for you was mother's milk. How did you? When did you first? When were you first introduced to C.S. Lewis, and who who introduced you? Yeah, as as you said, I took in Lewis and the Inklings with my mother's milk. Whether it was uh, Tolkien or Lewis or Dorothy Sayers or Chesterton or George MacDonald, um, you know, there's a whole whole range of of what's called the Seven who are very uh, significant. And as you mentioned, most of them are mythopoetic in their background. And it's not that they juxtapose myth to reason. They just see that, uh, they just see that myth, um, stories, narrative, uh, classical civilizations, and how they attempt and understand the relationship between the eternal uh, and time and the stories that could be told to reveal that were very significant and that can explain ways of being that just hard inductive, deductive, logical, mathematical ways do not get to. In fact, though, that sort of hyper rationalism conceals key elements of the human journey that the mythopoetic reveals. And, and people like, I mean, often, I mean, there's two sides to Lewis. There is, there is the rationalist, and some people draw him in for his apologetics and mere Christianity and problem of pain and miracles, and there's a whole range where he tries to dissect and make some sort of uh, ra limited but rational sense of how we deal with these perennially and troubling issues that beset all of us. But there's also deeper than Lewis is his, is his mythic uh, sensibilities in that sense. And really, uh, his earliest uh, inclinations and tendencies are mythic, whether it's Nordic myth, whether it's classical myth, um, Scandinavian myth. And so, uh, in that sense, as you rightly, uh, there's huge overlaps between Peterson's interest in myth and, and his early you know, Maps of Meaning, his first big tome, and um, Lewis. And there's a whole school of uh, thinkers that go back to, you know, a couple of centuries who they're, they're, they're decidedly in opposition, but not demeaning or dismissing a scientific, rational way of knowing and saying that the mythic, uh, the narrative, the stories uh, is a way of revealing elements of ourselves and of our journey that mere arguments can't do. Uh, and the more we, as it were, sit on the egg of a myth, uh, we never quite know what's going to hatch in our soul in that, in that sense. <laughs> yeah. And so people will often, people will often take Lewis, the rationalist, the apologist, but uh, there's, Lewis wrote far more in terms of his page, Chronicles of Narnia, on uh, a mythopoetic way uh, of knowing. And um, I think this is this is where certainly there's points of convergence between he and Jordan Peterson. What would be interesting to reflect on would be how uh, would Lewis have overlap with Peterson in their approach to myth, and where might they part paths in their understanding of myth? Because uh, both are, you know, in one sense, scholars. One coming at from a psychological perspective, uh, the other obviously a medieval Renaissance scholar. Uh, who understand, he grew up with myth, um, Lewis did, as did most of the Inklings. Um, and so um, I mentioned early also is that Lewis is somehow often but taken captive by the evangelical community in the United States. Um, the conservative evangelicals just dismiss him increasingly so. Uh, but the centrists don't quite know what to do with him because he's not a Calvinist. And some you know, were initially drawn to him because of his apologetics and turn to myth. Um, but given the fact he's a classical medieval Renaissance scholar, his whole approach to faith is quite different from an evangelical and a, and a reformed one. And so the whole Wheaton tradition that in one sense is sanitized and thinned out Lewis to some degree, to some degree, not totally, but, um, and then they've often turned him into a Republican also <laughs> politically. <laughs> Lewis was far too bright uh, to do that, and so this this thinning him out on the one hand to be a rationalist or an apologist for evangelical Christianity, or politically when it's fleshed out, he's on the right of center. Politically, uh, I don't think you can do that with Lewis. He's far too nimble a thinker to be drawn into that. Well, his his well his you know I've, I don't know how many 
biographies of Lewis I've read. I mean, he's a complicated man. And then Thank he write, then he marries Joy Davidman. Yes. I just finished a biography of her and boy, that's an interesting, she's an interesting woman and that's an interesting pair. And I think if, you know, if you look at Joy Davidman, who even after her Christian conversion is, is doing serious work in, in Scientology, it's a, <laughs> it's a fascinating, fascinating story. Oh, it is. And yeah, and Lewis's interaction with some of the leading thinkers at Oxford and Cambridge on interfaith issues um, and his whole understanding of common grace, it's quite elastic. And yeah. I was fortunate, the fellow who is in The Last Battle, Emmeth, yeah. uh, I don't know if you've read The Last Battle, but Emmeth is one of the, the seen as a part of the enemy to the Narnians. Uh, but he followed light wherever he could find it. And the person that Emmeth was modeled after was initially a student of Lewis's at Oxford, but he came to teach his final days at University of British Columbia. And so I spent some lovely time with, he was formerly a Muslim, family had elements of the Muslim Brotherhood. And when he became Christian, he, he lived in a very uh, delicate tightrope. Um, I remember spending the last uh, few weeks with him before he died and asking him, was the Emmeth of the last battle patterned after your time with Lewis when at Oxford? And he said, very much, I was one of the first um, um, initially Muslims and then people come from the Middle East that Lewis was uh, exposed to at that higher level of education. He was quite intrigued how someone who comes from a Muslim background trying to follow the light that they have would find their way to Catholic Christianity. And then, and then he ended up teaching at UBC for many decades in the literature department. Interesting, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. But there were, at Oxford and Cambridge, there was, I mean, in terms of the whole interfaith, some of the leading interfaith scholars were there at the time. And the letters between Lewis and Kathleen Rain and Zayner um, and, and many others for that, even Bede Griffiths and people like that were at the forefront of large contemplative interfaith dialogue. Lewis was very, very good. Good friend. I did a book on uh, Bede Griffiths and C.S. Lewis, and most Lewis people just have not touched Bede Griffiths, and yet Lewis dedicated Surprise by Joy to Bede Griffiths. And it was he and Bede Griffiths that came to Christianity together in the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, he called Gr uh, Griffiths my chief companion on the journey to Christianity, and one of the largest correspondence that exists uh, between Lewis is between he and Bede Griffiths. Really? And as the, the evangelical right tried to co-opt Lewis, it was B. Griffiths as, after Lewis died in 63, said, listen, I, was a, uh, I studied with them and the Lewis you're creating in the American, or sort of the Anglo-American context is virtually nothing to do with the C.S. Lewis that I knew. And so the battle is then who's the real C.S. Lewis? That's, I, you know, I, that you you know you're right. I've read a lot of Lewis, and B. Griffiths has not come up much. And so now I just pulled up I just pulled up Amazon and and pulled up your uh, pulled up your book on that. Now, and I noticed that not only uh, you've got C. S. Lewis and B. Griffiths, but you've got uh, C. S. Lewis and Thomas Merton. Yes. Now, now for me, I I read Merton. I think when I was in when I was in either late college or early seminary, I read you know a seven seven story mountain, and I I was just fascinated by that book at that point. That was so that would be the that would be the mid eighties, and so I was at that point in my own life. I was you know I was a so I was exploring I was exploring Pentecostal Christianity. I was exploring contemplative issues and. I had a pastor who was kind of had a foot in both of those. We would, you know, the church was ex exploring Pentecostal issues and gifts of, you know, gifts of the spirit, but also we were sneaking off to Catholic retreat centers and meditating and all that kind of stuff. That was, you know, that was the middle eighties for me. And, and I, you know, I, one of the things of course that caught my attention for Merton is he went to a, I didn't know that there was a, uh, a Catholic, um, a Catholic institution in the middle of Patterson, where I was living, Patterson, New Jersey. It's like Thomas Merton spent time in, of all places, Patterson, New Jersey. That was crazy. So, so what what connections did you see between Lewis and Merton? Well, first of all, um, Lewis wrote very explicitly that he thought some of Merton's writings were the very best 
of the 20th century on contemplative theology. Hmm. Uh, it probably should be noted, Mer um, Lewis had three elements to him, and this is part of the complex nature of him. There was the rationalist who wanted to make sense as far as you could through cognition and various forms of logical, empirical arguments. There was the romantic Lewis through myth and all that revealed. But there was also Lewis the mystic, and a finding book has come out uh, also on that recently. The, actually, the fellow, who, he and his wife have now taken over the Wade Center at Wheaton uh, into the region of awe, which is a very nice at looking at Lewis's connection to Evelyn Underhill and Dean Ng and the emergence of the, um, the emergence of the whole um, contemplative mystical tradition uh, in the Church of England at the beginning of the 20th century, of which Lewis was very consciously indebted to in his journey. And he corresponded with Evelyn Underhill, whose great classic work, Mysticism, was probably the preeminent work at the beginning of the 20th century. So Lewis has this um, mystical contemplative side that goes deeper than his romantic rationalist side. Um, but the complex nature, all three are held together in a very delicate and wise and judicious way. Now, Thomas Merton, as you mentioned, his first book that sold into the thousands after 1947, when it came in, Seven Story Mountain, um, uh, many people come back from World War II, face tragedy and death, and they're asking the big questions. What is the human journey about when you've lived in, in that way? It was really a, a very honest and transparent and personal journey to faith. Yeah. Uh, and you can obviously see the mystical contemplative longing of Merton in that. And he then turns to the Catholic Church, but finally to the Cistercian order, um, and so of which some of the great Cistercian writers like Bernard de Clairvaux and William St. Thierry and Ildre de Vavoux, people like this emerge. And so um, they both, Merton and Lewis, share this um, uh, center of the contemplative uh, in that sense. It's what they both share with T.S. Eliot. Uh, and again, Lewis and T.S. Eliot became the best of friends the last 15 years of their life after sparring for 15 years. Yeah, yeah. And um, so uh, Merton, on the other hand, Merton, on the other hand, was uh, very fond of C.S. Lewis. He thought C.S. Lewis is one of the finest writers of the 20th century. So what often happens is you get the Merton people, the Roman Catholic, the contemplative, the meditative, who are sort of in the Merton tribe or clan, but they don't know a lot about the Inklings and the C.S. Lewis people who have been co-opted by the evangelicals. And of course, Merton wasn't reformed or evangelical, so he, but, but then the Inklings, many of them were Anglican or Catholic, so you can't shrink them to a reformed evangelical way. And so what Merton and Lewis share is a Catholicity grounded in the classical tradition, which at the core is a contemplative mystical heritage. And so um, when one breaks out of the way they've been, um, what shall I say, cabin cribbed and confined by their tribes, they both transcend that. And you can see where Lewis and Merton come together as dancing partners in hmm. terms of um, uh, in terms of their understanding of their faith and how how you uh, how you live it, but the danger is that this is being overcome. I think I, I've been at a variety of events the last few years in which people who have emerged within the Inklings Mert, um, Lewis clan are beginning to see there's much to. I mean, you can't study the Inklings and not move in a Catholic direction. That's just a given. Uh, and so when you move in that direction, you're going to bump into Merton. And Merton is probably one of the most significant pioneers of the revival of the contemplative tradition of the 20th century. And so inevitably, these two come together, there's an uh, intersection on the trail. And so there is this fascinating convergence occurring between people searching for depth and finding it both in the Inklings and Lewis and also finding it obviously in Merton. And then the whole spin-off industry both of Merton and Centering Prayer and the whole meditative yeah. traditions and their, their sort of second or third level activists or thinkers of which Merton is much more the towering Everest in that sense. Um, but the, you can't separate the deeper you go, uh, Lewis uh, from Merton, uh, even though many have. But I think that sociological reality is being overcome as people are looking for greater depth uh, and meditative ways of knowing, uh, and um, they can take the path of Lewis and the Inklings, but when they do that, they're gonna bump into Merton. Uh, 
and people following the Merton contemplative path in time uh, are going to eventually arrive at the Inklings and Lewis. What they share also is a great suspicion of the Reformation forward. Lewis considered the Reformation a tragic farce, and um, Merton, the more he probed the patristic and classical tradition, he eventually became more ironical. Like in Seven Story Mountain, he's, you know, like new converts can be a little belligerent and thinking they found all the truth in the way. And, uh, he, he, he changed his tone considerably after Seven Story Mountain, and you find a, a maturing, a softening, a broadening out in Merton, uh, which he would have picked up in the best of um, Lewis as well, and their understanding of uh, understanding of interfaith issues. But, I, think, I think also neither could be trapped in the tribalism of right, left, or center politics either. And that's, I always get worried when people want to either uh, pit Merton into leftist anarchist protest politics or Merton into, Rep or Lewis into Republican politics. It's, um, they're too subtle and nimble of thinkers to be trapped in that cage or that Procrustean bed. So was there, was there much letter writing between Merton and Lewis? No, what you get in there, they're, they were both prolific writers, not only published um, articles, books, but uh, in terms of letters and journals, um, the uh, Mer Merton will mention Lewis a variety of times, and Lewis mentions, uh, Lewis mentions Merton. And they also, their names come up in letters in which they're writing to other people. So okay. the more one probes the letters written, because both are prolific writers. I yeah. mean, they, uh, one sense their vocation, one, most people know them through their books and um, their articles, uh, but actually the libraries of letters they wrote, they really took correspondence as a vocation. And uh, and so once you get into their volumes and volumes of letters, you can their names pop up when they mention. People will ask, "Who would you suggest I read?" To going a little further and deeper, and Lewis will mention Merton, and Merton will mention Lewis. Interesting, that's fascinating. I haven't I haven't dug into Lewis's letters much, and you know it's it's fortunate that. You know, he of course Lewis was a very famous famous letter writer in terms of trying to respond to everyone who wrote him, which was a Herculean task given you know typewriters and fortunately Warney was there. It sounds like who pitched a hand. So um, that's that's fascinating. I had never I had never known any connection between the two or thought of the two in that connection. I've paid over over my lifetime considerably more attention to Lewis and again always had favorable feelings towards Merton but never really pursued him much but that's probably just part of my location in the um, you know in terms of where my where my life has where my life has panned out yeah there's a series of articles uh, emerging they have been emerging in the last few years on comparing and contrasting uh, Lewis and Merton. I gave a lecture at Regent College a couple of years ago uh, because Regent is, well, Regent College in Canada on the West Coast. Right. Uh, it, I mean, the, the inklings in Lewis and this group are, are much lauded within that centrist evangelical tradition, the relationship of faith and the arts and culture and this, this sort of business of which then the inklings offer an alternate to a uh, a too busy confessional approach to faith or uh, um, a narrow or exegetical or a, um, being too fixated on um, creedal approaches. And um, the corrective to that is people are trying to look at the relationship of faith in the arts, faith in culture, faith right. in painting, faith in music, this sort of, but they haven't really explored because um, really it's only up to the last couple of decades that the reformed evangelical tradition has become more open to the Roman Catholic heritage. Yeah. And once that openness occurs, and underneath that openness is the question of a new generation asking questions about a contemplative, meditative way of knowing. Well, as soon as those questions are being asked, uh, then you're right on the holding hands with Mert on the journey. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, just in my lifetime, I've really noticed a laying down of arms when, you know, when I was going, I, typical Christian reformed, 
at least part of my life was typical Christian Reformed. A lot of another part of my life was very untypical Christian Reformed. But you know, I went to Christian Reformed day school, and and then Calvin College and seminary, and you know the the telling of the Reformation was. I mean, these were this was the this was the revival of the church. You know, the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit flew the coop somewhere after. You know, the Apostle John on Patmos wrote the book of Revelation and then suddenly came back down on Martin Luther and off we went again. But that, you know, I, I can even tell in my, you know, in just my cousins in a, in a small town in Massachusetts, if they were, you know, if they were, when the Christian school teachers came in, all the mothers of sons were looking very hard to make sure that they would, you know, find a Christian school teacher and settle down for fear that their sons might marry a Catholic girl. And today, even in that small town, you know, doing joint projects and services with the Catholic church, which is literally right across the street from the Christian Reformed Church, that is an enormous change in a small amount of time with almost no theological conversation and 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 so that then you know that that lowering of that wall then allows hmm, now we can read each other's books and we thought we can they, they kind of started with henry nowen of course because of the dutch crc well henry nowen's dutch so he's catholic but he can't be all bad if he's dutch dutch <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's two directions going on sociologically, isn't there, at the present time. There's the attempt to overcome the siloism and the tribalism of various theologies and ecclesiologies which flow from that and say, listen, we share a Catholic uh, heritage in terms, we are all part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. How we understand that is going to move us into the future. The other is the reaction to that that's happening at the present time, of reinforcing those islands and, and then, and, and then uh, bad-mouthing and um, dismissing and demeaning people who are not, say, of a Reformed tradition or of an evangelical tradition or elements of certain elements of the Roman Catholic tradition or the Orthodox. We're the true church, you know, and the pure faith was, was locked into the second of the sixth centuries. And so we're, we're getting two things happening sociologically. Uh, one is a, a generous overcoming of the tribalism uh, rooted in a Catholic, a Catholic contemplative theology. Um, the other is a reinforcing of, um, of a tribalism of the past. And uh, it, much hinges on where these two directions unfold into the future, but well, it's definitely being played out in a variety, um, a variety of ways at the present time. And Lewis and Merton certainly point in the direction of that Catholic contemplative, what some call generous orthodoxy. I don't think McLaren is very deep in his understanding of that term, and I think he uh, is a bit of a voyeur and a dilettante. But he's pointing to something that, uh, when explored in a more substantive way in terms of contemplative theology, uh, similar to Peterson pointing, sort of the post-evangelical revisionists, they realize that they have lost much in a shrinking of faith, and they're groping for something older, more rooted, more grounded. Um, they don't have the goods. Um, but they're pointing, and others perhaps will pick up on that, and next generation will have a much greater depth theologically, exegetically, historically, on how that's going to be understood and lived forth in, you know, post-Christendom, post-secular, post-scientific, sort of broadly speaking, interfaith world, and how, how people of faith engage those questions without slipping into a, uh, a too easy pluralism. Uh, which really distorts uh, in many ways, or a relativism, uh, or a syncretism, which is um, which is not, which again distorts. And uh, Lewis was exposed to all of this very early, this post-Christian, as was Merton, uh, and so their writings on how one does interfaith dialogue are very rich in, in the, the veins in the gold mine are very insightful. Um, so there tends to be two traditions. One, 
um, Christianity has nothing to do with other religions. We're the good, true, and beautiful. And if you're not of us, then we, our job's to convert or isolate ourselves. The other is a convergence, which essentially says they're all going in the same direction or they're just different paths. Uh, the middle way is to say, um, no, there's a way through this one which honors the Christian tradition, which looks at the concord between religions, but there are discrete differences at core level. And it's only when that is understood that you understand Lewis and Merton and how they made sense. Because the future is really, as people are growing beyond uh, you know, the scientific and the secular models, they're asking the big questions, what do other faiths offer? In that sense, I think Merton and Lewis, and there's many others for that matter, can offer markings or cairns on the path in terms of, because they've gone further and people are asking those questions. These are the people that should be reading and internalizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, last time we talked, you uh, introduced me to a German, uh, a, a German novelist, Hermann Hesse, Hesse, Hesse who, who actually wrote a novel that uh, won a Nobel Prize and and I noticed in doing a little bit of research before we talked today that that you've got a you've got you've got at least three videos out there on on this novel entitled The Glass Bead Game. And I did a little poking around and looking at it. I haven't I haven't read it, but it's it strikes me that we're we're focusing, you know, so Hesse Hess wrote it in the 30s. You know, obviously for Lewis, the 30s was the time of his conversion. You know, a, a World War One, a World War One veteran. He had the right kind of wound that allowed him to to survive the war. Obviously, the death of his of his buddy um, didn't you know moved him in terms of his relationship then with his friend's mother and that whole arc in Lewis. When did when did Merton come to faith? Well, Bert Merton, uh, I mean, he came to faith in the late 1930s. Okay. So, um, and then his question is, well, what form should my faith take? Because obviously when people come to Christianity, the next question, there's variations ecclesially, yeah. uh, theologically, exegetically, and he moved fairly quickly into the Roman Catholic tradition. He taught at St. Bonaventura for a time, but he, 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 Vocationally, Merton was very drawn to the contemplative heritage, which is um, foundational to Catholic theology. And he thought the monastic tradition would um, provide the pathway. He became sorely disappointed when he entered the Cistercian order, realizing they were busier with their divine offices and their farming than was New York at rush hour. And, and so the monastic tradition, which was supposed to be a, a, a font of the contemplative uh, Merton through much of his life was at the heart of unearthing the rich layered Christian contemplative heritage theologically and how you live it but also it's what drew him to interfaith issues too because who are the people who are practicing these um, um, these approaches today so whether it was DT Suzuki or um, Dalai Lama to this day considers in some ways Merton his his uh, mentor. Hmm. Uh, Merton spent his last days a few visits with the younger Dalai Lama in Dharamsala and he considers he very variety of times he's gone to Gethsemane and just sat at the graveyard um, of Thomas Merton Dalai hmm. Lama. He holds Merton in such high high esteem as he said when I think of Christianity I think of Thomas Merton Wow. Was Thich Nhat Hanh, the great um, Buddhist monk, many people read Thich Nhat Hanh's his works on awakening and mindfulness. Um, but he fled Vietnam when the Americans were bombing, uh, and Merton was became very good friends. So I corresponded with Thich Nhat Hanh uh, for a while uh, as well. But um, but yeah, so Herman Hesse, there's um, again like Merton and Lewis, uh, there has been been many misreads of Herman Hesse. There's the Hermann Hesse of Europe and Germany, the, the highly cultured European artist, writer, novelist, poet. Um, and he was mostly unknown in North America until he won the Nobel Prize in 46. And then all of his writings in German um, began to speak to emerging counterculture. So anyone who was 
in any way interested in the North American counterculture of the late 50s, 60s, and 70s, a rite of passage was to read Herman Hesse. Hmm. He was the guru of the counterculture. Uh, the dilemma of that was he, he became so knit together with the counterculture, a variety of books he wrote, is that as the counterculture, that wave crashed on the shoreline and disappeared, Hesse disappeared with it because he was equated as the guru of the counterculture in some ways. And so he, he almost disappeared for a few decades. And gratefully so, in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a renaissance of Hermann Hesse hmm. and uh, the much more mature Hesse, who, uh, who grew up in a, one of the most influential German pietists um, families in Europe. Parents were missionaries, both in India and um, uh, uh, so Hesse grew up with that, but it, it, he felt too constricted and confined, and much of his journey is, is a growing out of that German pietism, but a great respect for the Catholic tradition. In this sense, Hesse anticipates Lewis and Merton. Hmm. Uh, so he does, some people say, well, Hermann Hesse, he turned from his Christian faith to the East. That's not what Mer anyone who reads his journey to the East or glass bead game or Siddhartha. He's, he's, because there's this tradition of many in the East who turn against Christianity, uh, turn, see science as inadequate to fulfill the deeper human questions. Secularism is not working. And so there's a romanticism of the Orient, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, some variation of Confucianism or Taoism. Um, so something that Hesse was at the forefront of pioneering a post-Christendom, post-science turn to the East. And even his small little miss of journey to the East, most people think he's going to the East. That's not what the title's about uh, in any way. Um, uh, Hesse was looking uh, East in German. It, it's it's the, the word that's actually used is you're turning to the, you're turning to the, the source of, of where light begins to dawn again, um, East in that sense of where the sun rises, not East in the sense of the Orient. Uh, but most people read it as a, a manifesto for turning to various forms of oriental uh, religions. Um, and Hesse, like Lewis and Merton, I might add, a voluminous correspondent. Many people, are, Hesse was one of the first critics of German nationalism and the bellicose spirit of, that led to World War I. He fled, he fled Germany, uh, went to Switzerland where he spent, spent his days and as things began to emerge in the 20s, and he saw, Hess saw far ahead of his time what was happening in Germany and was writing in the 20s against it long before Hitler came to power. Um, uh, and many German immigrants who fled, very good friends with Thomas Mann and many of the great German writers. Um, his home in Switzerland became a sort of a refuge, uh, refugee site for the European intellectuals who saw you know, things are not right in Denmark here in terms of what was happening in Europe in the 30s. And, um, and so Hesse, Hesse was this um, probably one of the most significant um, European writers of the 20th century who was thinned out a bit by the American counterculture of the late 50s, 60s, and 70s. And gratefully, there is this Phoenix-like revival of him. And his great work is The Glass Bead Game. Uh, and at the heart of the Glassby game are these intellectuals um, who are trained in Castalia. They're the creme de menthe of all thinkers. And they're trained to, um, the game essentially is one of beads of thought of various cultures and religions and philosophical traditions and trying to, trying to string them all together in a great synthesis because the, the Glassby game comes out of the period of the Great Wars when cultures and religions had clashed and, and fragmented and killed one another in the name of religion and politics and nationalism. So the vocation of the Castalians, the elite of the elite, uh, were trained to reflect on, can we move into the future by synthesizing the very best that has been thought and said? Now, Hess is, he's poking fun at this a little bit because the Castalians, as it were, lived on mountaintops and like they were in monastic contexts. And so the question always was, what's the relationship of this highly sophisticated synthesis uh, 
of the noblest that has been thought throughout time and history, cross civilization cultures into a great unity as move into the future. What's the relationship of the Vita Contemplativa? And when you go down to the mountainside where the ignorant armies clash by night, or the Vita Activa, and of course, Magister Ludi or Joseph Connect in that sense, uh, uh, he reaches the highest level of the Castalians, but he has various students that say, well, What's the relationship to this very, um, this very uh, sophisticated synthesis of thought and actually people who live their day-to-day -day life in the valley where nations fight and tribes turn on one another, who they're not interested in this sort of stuff. And can this be made relevant uh, in that sense? It's a similar, universities are like Castalians in that sense, trying to synthesize, analyze, dissect. And the, in that sense, um, Hess knew all this world inside and out. And in one sense, elements of the brittleness of thought when you deal with power politics. And I mean, you get this in obviously in Plato's Gorgias and the Republic and all of these issues. When what happens when power and wisdom collide? Uh, what then is a person to do? But The Glass Bead Game is probably, I would consider, one of the most important novels of the 20th century. Uh, I, I won't say he won the Nobel Prize for it. He won the Nobel Prize for a whole life of contribution to European literary, poetic, political, economic um, life. And so, uh, but he shares a great deal. I mean, in, when Merton was on the last stage of his life in 1968, he's reading Hermann Hesse, whether hmm. it's the Dartha or a variety of uh, a variety of other works. And um, Hesse was deeply Catholic in his thinking. Uh, some people, when they're raised in you know um, a certain backgrounds, they find too narrow. They turn against it. Uh, Hesse was too wise and ironical and pastoral and kindly. Uh, his view was, what was the good in what I was raised in and what may be some of the blind spots? Uh, what is the good in the Catholic heritage? One of the, mo the most lovely chapters in the Glassby game is the two orders. So you have this intellectual class, the Castellian synthesizing thought, but Joseph Connect goes to essentially a Benedictine abbey and meets Father Jacobus, who uh, says, you know, this is this sort of new age synthesis sort of uh, is interesting, but we've been around for thousands of years and we know how to institutionalize these more difficult uh, issues. And so there's a fascinating conversation between, and there's a variety of people who today are trying to synthesize ideas and religion and science and secularism and one grand synthesis. And they're just Castalians in that sense. And Hesse saw that played out, but they're, they're grounded in nothing institutionally or no real substantive community which carries that memory forward. And so that lovely chapter in two orders uh, is a very significant and probing discussion between intellectuals who play games of, of integrating ideas and synthesizing ideas cross civilization time as we move into the future, what Carl Josper is called the second axial age. Uh, and what happens when you greet people who have been doing that for 2,000 years, like Benedictine Catholics, mm -hmm. who know what it means to grapple with those things. So that the two orders is a fascinating discussion of sort of a brittle intellectualism that synthesizes, but's grounded in nothing historically. So, but it's so, probably one of, what's that? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so it's probably, I think, one of the, the most superb intellectual novels of the 20th century of someone who had lived through the dynamics of the role of intellectuals trying to make sense of where history is going Hegelian-like, and yet on the other hand, what is happening in the valley of nations and cultures and ethnicities that will just, um, for most part, just ignore what's going on amongst Castalian or university culture in that sense. And so it's an interesting uh, study of the role of thought in a contemplative meditative way of knowing that's about synthesis. And in that sense, Journey to the East is the first little primer that's worth reading. And then um, Hesse dedicates Glassby Game to what he calls the Journeyers to the East. So hmm. these are companion books. Uh, and they're, they have a perennial significance of someone who lived through the 20th century and saw the relationship between thinking and the brittle nature of elements of synthesis, which are not grounded in any historic communities which carry the vision forward and live through these crises of power and wisdom. So, so I'm just pulling up a little bit of information on Hesse 
died in 62, of course. Lewis died in 63. Uh, Merton died? 68. 68, okay. Interesting. Any, um, I, I don't recall, you're the one, I'd never bumped into Hesse at all until you mentioned him. Uh, it, the, and so that I was listening to the the videos that you've that you've got out there, and I'll put those in the I'll put those in the notes here for pe people to listen to them. It's it's uh, I thought I found the the videos that you did with Brad Jersick about these to be very, you know, really very quickly brought me up to speed. Could understand you know kind of where this is going. You know, it's it's interesting how you know Lewis Lewis was a you know, he, he was kind of the picture of the of the professor who is so smart he's not worth a darn thing. I mean, he didn't drive. Um, he, you know, what 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 could what could Lewis do for himself? Uh, but as in terms of how his at least the best that I know of, in terms of how his faith worked out beyond his vocation, obviously of thinking and writing. Uh, you know, his the amount of personal benevolence he did. I mean, he'd give away, he'd give away all of his money and then, oh my goodness, I have to pay this taxes on the money I've already given away, get himself into trouble. And of course, Joy David, and then, you know, the whole, whole you know, Lewis, if someone's going to be a personal manager of Lewis, oh my goodness, what a, what a disaster the man was. But, but then taking the form of this simple Anglican. So he, you know, in many of his essays writes, you know, writes about, you know, going to church and can't stand the music and all of this, but then realizing that the, the simple Anglican that he's sharing the, the bench with, who's, who's a gardener or some such thing, how Lewis esteems him. So, you know, all these, this beautiful, Lewis finds his, finds his Christian polit, you know, piety in this, in becoming a simple Anglican. Of course, he writes about that in, in screw tape letters quite a bit. Merton goes and becomes, you know, you know, becomes a monastic, becomes a monk in the 20th century of all places. Uh, and, and here Hesse, you know, escapes to Switzerland and, and writes what any, anything. And, and then of course the glass feed game you have, as I listen to your, as I listen to your tapes or the, the videos of you, you're, you're having this, you're having this. Okay. So, so, so we've got the intellectuals playing the glass bead game in, in some crazy ways. You know, the, the glass bead game brings us the bomb, obviously, in the 40s. I mean, this, this period of the, of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, such a, such a concentrated, packed period of the 20th century where, you know, so much is being worked through. You know, one of the things I often reflect on is, you know, thinking about our times with this, you know, the kinds of culture war things that Peterson is addressing. I often note resonances between now and the 30s in, in terms of wrestling with all of, all of these elements. You know, one of the things that gets quickly forgotten after the Second World War is the ubiquity of, of eugenics mm -hmm. up until the 30s. And it's, it's almost like watching the Nazis made the West say, all right, we're not going to talk about eugenics anymore. And now, obviously, with the increasing power of AI, um, us looking towards ourselves to say, we want to make machines that think, well, how do we think? And so watching the rise of cognitive science, I've been paying more attention to, to John Verveke lately. It's, it's interesting that these, these elements, such as Lewis and Merton and Hess coming out of the 30s, you know, responding to World War I, I read, I forget the author's name, but a, a very interesting book about the religious aspects of World War I, again, something that wasn't in any way, um, World War I is often kind of glided over as the predecessor for World War II, where, you know, which was the Big Bang in so many ways. So it's interesting how the relevance of these writers who very much were molded and shaped by the First World War and came into their power in the 30s and then 40s, lived into just the beginning of the 60s. Um, it's interesting how now, you know, obviously, let's say an 80-year time frame, that's enough distance now that we can sort of look back on them 
with enough distance to find interest. And it's interesting how these three come together and, and in a sense how these three have come together through you and in you. Now, why, why do you, where do you see those lines connecting? Well, one thing you mentioned, which I think is pertinent, is there's a tendency with Lewis, Mert, and Hesse just to look at the sheer wealth of their literary, philosophical, theological, contemplative element. Uh, but they were also a people who you mentioned earlier, Lewis would go to a very simple Anglican parish. As a medieval Renaissance person, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is what Matthew Arnold calls God's plenty. And the great difference between the common person that you're there for, who will, I mean, they would, wouldn't understand Lewis, but he was there as, for them, to be by their side, uh, often be misunderstood, not heard. Most wouldn't know who he was in any sophisticated sense. But he was just there, sitting at the pew, taking the sacraments, uh, quite different from the Bunyan Puritanism in which I'm right, I march off alone, I leave my wife and the kids in terms of some pure faith. And so you get the same thing in Merton, the monastery, you know, most in the monastery, it grew from about 40 to 50, and because of seven-story mountain, it grew to well close to 400 in a few years, uh, and it drove Merton crazy. Um, <laughs> Uh, but again, most didn't understand Merton. What's a monk writing about politics and the nuclear issue and First Nations issues and environmental issues? Just do the divine offices and teach the novices. And uh, uh, he was often misunderstood, but he was faithful in love uh, to be with those who misread him, misunderstood him, and uh, the vow of stability, which is, uh, I think, a very important, in an age of mobility that we live in, the notion of stability in parish, or in Merton's case, monastery, in Lewis's at Oxford or Cambridge, or his parish. Uh, for Hermann Hess, it was his home in Montagnola, uh, southern Switzerland, where he stayed, stability. He was not, I mean, one of the great um, uh, spiritual virtues is stability. And when we take a vow of stability, it means we have to be with people we don't always get along with. We see things differently. Right. They say things which you think, what, you know, what planet are you coming from? Or we're a few bricks short of a load, you know? <laughs> um, and so one of the common threads that interests me about them is how they thread together fairly sophisticated cultural, intellectual, literary thought with a simple piety in which you're there for the person in the pew in the monastery or the people who come and see you at your home in hospitality mm -hmm. and you don't judge people or just hobnob with the literary elite or the philosophical elite um, when that happens it's a form of veiled narcissism and to me the test of um, you know lewis had a lovely saying the the, the ripest are the kindest to the raw and mm -hmm. the most studious have the great amount of time to spare uh, and i think one thing about the three of them, in their different ways, they were deeply pastoral. And they brought together uh, fairly sophisticated, I mean, you know, teaching at Oxford or Cambridge. And the, I mean, Merton was one of the most prolific writers of the 20th century. Uh, Hesse wins the Nobel Prize. We're not, we're not, we're not talking, uh, you know, about people that in one sense had not made it culturally. They had, they had reached the very peak culture, but they never uh, took their laurels in a way that would make them in any way demean the common person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They knew deep down they were common people. Mm -hmm. uh, their mm -hmm. gifts were their gifts, but they shared a great affinity with the common person in the pew. And I found in, for me, um, you know, because uh, the tendency when you're university trained and you teach in university and you hobnob with people who mm -hmm. conferences and books and writing and your world is Castalia, for the most part is you know the common people what or what Nietzsche would call the herd why do I want anything to do with that and that shows a definite lack of charity and a definite lack of pastoral concerns and the tendency is to flip from one intellectual place to another one retreat center one guru to another and yet it's in the simple life of family um, and the simple life of the parish, in Merton's case, the monastery, and Hesse at his home, that you see this integration, this integration of meaningful thinking with pastoral care for the common person. And I think I found both of them very helpful 
in that because you can have people who are very pastoral but they don't think a lot you know their relationality and it's pastoral and i mean but when you get to serious cultural they're just not there you can't blame them and the danger of intellectuals is they distance themselves from the common person you know in the pew and even when they attend church and they just stay with those they know uh and that's that that shows a lack of love a lack of charity a lack of being so in the sense lewis's chaucer's canterbury tales is a wonderful story you get everything for the gentle perfect connect to the wife of bath and everything in between they know where they're going they're going to canterbury where where um, Beckett was killed by Henry Spears, uh, but they're a very complex group, and you just stay together on the trail uh, in all your imperfections, and you don't get sort of little purist elite types, mm -hmm. uh, but you recognize the human condition for what it is, and the task is, can we actually initiate going out to people who are not like us and of us? In that sense, they embody a sort of pluralism <laughs> and multiculturalism of the soul. Yeah that is way ahead of their time. So I would say in terms of what they have taught me over the years is how you bring together um, fairly sophisticated cultural, literary, philosophical, theological, political life with common pastoral concern for your average person as they go through the hatch, match, and dispatch seasons of life. You know? And so that, that's where they've taught me a lot. And they become, in that sense, mentors to me. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, it does. I, again, looking at Hess's, doesn't appear to have married. Well, no, well, he did. He, yeah, he had a very difficult first marriage. Oh, okay. A very, a very short second marriage, which was very painful. And then he, with Ninon, uh, he spent most of his last uh, decades of his did life. Did he have children? Uh, yeah, yeah, he had a few, a few boys. Okay. Three boys. Yeah, yeah. he had three, three boys. And, uh, uh, quite a journey he had. He was a very sensitive artistic type. Mm. And so he constantly, his life is a, it's a fascinating story of the art whose vocation is an artist and how do you deal with the slings and arrows that come your way. I often found his first book really spoke to me in the 60s. Uh, it, it's called Under the Wheel. And it's the story of what formal education can do to a creative person. Hmm. When I was in high school in the 60s, I mean, I just didn't fit into the curriculum. And I felt like I was under the wheel. The curriculum constantly ran over me. <laughs> and I would be bringing my teachers Plato and Aristotle and wanting their reflections on the poetics or, you know, what are your thoughts in the Bible here and comparing these great texts and, and the fathers. And, of course, the teachers would say to me, that's irrelevant. Just cover it. The course. This is what you got to do. But I said, that doesn't interest me. I'm interested in. And, and so it, it, what Hesse experienced at school, he was constantly under the wheel of a formal curriculum and he was crushed by it. And I, I often found his book under the wheel always was helpful for me in the 60s, 70s, because I could relate to what Hesse experience i did terrible in high school i failed twice and i never finished and i left with the saying by mark twain don't let school interfere with your education and um I traveled that's where i initially ended up in switzerland and my mom sent me a book by schaefer escape from escape from reason i'd been traveling and living with the sami way up in northern norway equivalent to the what we call laplanders and she said why don't you go to this place given where you are in your search and this would have been the early 70s and so i ended up ended up hiking with a franciscan up to labrie wow prior yes so uh so but yeah so for about seven or eight years i couldn't even relate to formal education i was under the wheel of the curriculum that crushed me uh trying to think creatively about what's important in life and what formal education doesn't provide that teachers didn't uh and so hesse was very helpful for me on that Interesting. You know, what, what, as you're talking, one of, one of the things in my own little uh, Jordan Peterson meetup group we have in Sacramento, I've noticed, I've noticed again this strange, which, which has been true of my congregation at Living Stones. Living Stones is this outrageously diverse church that has had people who are illiterate. I'd have to help them write checks because they didn't know how to write, sitting next to PhDs. And even in the you know, even in the meetup, I've, I've got people who are like you, they've dropped out of school. Some of them dropped out of school frighteningly early, but gone on to, 
be successful in whatever field, which is, I think, more and more difficult to do today because the information systems are so tight that if you, you know, it, it's harder to falsify your resume just to patch over something that, yeah, you can do that job, but if someone says, well, you don't have a BA or you don't, you might even have a high school diploma, they're not even going to talk to you. Yeah. And but it's but and sitting next to some folks who are PhDs, some university university professors um, come to the meetup too, and it's it's interesting. Again, this this nexus that you've you've kind of weaved over here of how how, how to how to put it, but but where people who are people who are interested in not only the glass bead game, but but also the um, the life the life of the life of getting hands dirty and the life of the life of sitting with sitting with sitting with anyone um, you know under understanding understanding the richness in the people that most of society will never pay any attention to because they don't show up in they don't show up in the ways that we rank order others. So, um, no, that was beautiful. Yeah, that's that why beautiful. I love. That's why I love Lewis's quote that the ripest are kindest to the raw. Yeah. And uh, if a person has had the privilege to get a lot of formal education, but they're not pastorally um, interested with the rawest, you know, the, the rawest parts of the human journey, then to me, their learning is just an opiate in that sense. Yeah. I, you know, I, I learned so much of that from my father who, um, you know, spent most of his life. My father was a very, obviously a very bright man, but spent most, he had a, had an offer to go to the free university when he graduated Calvin seminary, which was in that, in that school, that's what you did. You went to the free university in the Netherlands and you, you know, got your degree there. And then you would come back to the United States and the Christian reformed church and but instead, he went to Patterson, New Jersey, and spent 36 years uh, helping people. Uh, there were many times when I was a teenager, and he'd say, "Oh, Paul, you got to come with me because we've got to move someone." And so we'd be we'd be huffing and puffing with stoves and fridges up, uh, you know. And and this was this is how my father spent his life, and you know, a library full of books, but but happier, so able able to realize that. You know, all of these books are wonderful, but a single a single human being has more mystery in them than a library full of books. And if you're patient and quiet enough, um, they might just open themselves to you, and and you can see glory. So it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, if we don't, uh, I think your point is wise. If we don't go from the wisdom of books to the book of a person's life before us then we don't understand the purpose of books yeah 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 and then books and education becomes a form of escapism so your father was obviously a deeply honorable person in the way he integrated those two yeah yeah and and i think you know one of the things that you know a healthy tradition we were talking in our meetup about you know what is a what is a healthy culture a healthy culture is the kind of culture that can afford to give to its youth the kinds of wisdom they have not yet had time to amass for themselves mm -hmm. and so my father growing up within within his tradition learning this so that he could you know he could embody these things and and pass these on to um, those he worked with, and obviously myself, who who grew up in his home, and so on and so forth. So, well, I, I really appreciate this talk, Ron. This is this has been lovely, and I, I've learned a ton, and was able to make some connections I didn't know existed before. And um, thank you, thank you so much for you know spending this time, and 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 why? I mean, I I just enjoy being able to, you know here you know being able to plug in and and benefit from your wisdom and your reading you know as a pastor of a local church or you know i'm a generalist so i get to read books but i spend time with people and to, to deep dive into some of this stuff i don't always have the have the opportunity to so i, I really appreciate this oh, well a well-laden table indeed <laughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop the recording and then we can we can finish up okay